In today's talk, we will address the question of how do antipsychotic medications work. This question has a lot of overlap with the question, what causes schizophrenia? The question is interesting because we are better able to understand how drugs work than we are unknown illnesses, and the hope is that as we better understand how drugs work, we come closer to learning the cause of the disease state that they treat. I thought it would be interesting to begin this discussion by reviewing the discovery of the very first antipsychotic medication, chlorpromazine, which was eventually sold in the United States under the brand name Thorazine. Antihistamines had become available for clinical use in the 1940s, and during the course of their clinical use, surgeons discovered that operations were easier when patients had received antihistamines ahead of surgery. This insight led to um, a drive to discover, to develop antihistamines that had greater CNS permeability, and chlorpromazine was the ultimate result of that drug development effort. Chlorpromazine was first used in surgical patients and met the intended goals of improving clinical course during surgery and recovery. More specifically, chlorpromazine and related antihistamines were found to reduce blood pressure variations during surgery and to reduce the incidence of surgical shock. Uh, a curious observation, a serendipitous observation about chlorpromazine is that when patients were recovering from surgery after having been given chlorpromazine, uh, they were noted to recover with more calmness and relaxed appearances than was uh, typical. These observations in surgical patients led to clinical testing in hospitalized psychiatric patients where it was revealed that chlorpromazine appeared particularly effective for the patients that were suffering from schizophrenia. This remarkable finding led to the important question, what about this molecule was responsible for these therapeutic benefits? And subsequent pharmacological studies showed that chlorpromazine was able to interfere with the signaling of a variety of different neurotransmitters, specifically by blocking uh, their receptors. Chlorpromazine, it was shown, is able to interfere with or modulate the signaling of dopamine, histamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, or serotonin. So these early pharmacological studies produced no shortage of possibilities to explain the therapeutic action of the drug. And the neurotransmitter targets identified in the early pharmacological studies of chlorpromazine were validated in subsequent studies of a fairly large number of antipsychotic drugs that came to the market thereafter. Uh, this table lists the various neurotransmitter receptors that are targeted by FDA-recognized antipsychotic drugs. Eventually, it became apparent that by blocking the dopamine receptor, particularly at the D2 subtype, one can very reliably alleviate psychotic symptoms. And this finding formed one of the pillars of what was eventually to become known as the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. The other pillar of the hypothesis um, arises from the observation that drugs that augment the dopamine signal, amphetamine being a prototypical example, can reliably induce psychotic states. This slide helps to visualize the importance of dopamine receptor blocking as a mechanism relevant to the effect of antipsychotic drugs. The various dots on the graph um, represent specific antipsychotic medications. The y-axis uh, depicts the affinity of the drug for the D2 receptor, and the graph is such that the lower the number, the higher the affinity of the drug. Meanwhile, on the x-axis, we see the effective oral dose, oral dose of the various agents. And what you can see very clearly is that the relationship is extremely linear between the ability of a drug to occupy and bind to the dopamine D2 receptor and its potency at relieving the uh, symptoms of psychosis in people affected by schizophrenia. So this strikingly linear relationship um, provides fairly strong support for the idea that dopamine receptor antagonism is a mechanism which is central to the antipsychotic efficacy of these medications.
That dopamine is relevant to schizophrenia is supported by several lines of inquiry in human subjects. In clinical samples from schizophrenia-affected individuals, we can routinely detect higher densities of dopamine receptors in their brains, and we also find that these D2 receptor populations exist in higher affinity states for dopamine than in other populations. If we look at blood or cerebrospinal fluid, we're able to detect higher concentrations of circulating dopamine metabolites, which suggests that in these individuals there is a higher activity of dopamine signaling going on in the central nervous system. And in positron emission tomography, we can now actually visualize dopamine synthesis of human subjects in vivo. And we see in this graph the dark blue bar showing that subjects with a form of schizophrenia that responds to antipsychotic medications do in fact have higher ability to synthesize dopamine in their brains. This graph also reveals an interesting caveat to the dopamine hypothesis dogma. Recall that the dark blue bar shows high dopamine synthesis, but that is only in one subset of patients with schizophrenia. We see that with the light blue bar is equal in height to the green bar. The light blue bar represents patients with treatment-resistant schizophrenia. So this study tells us that treatment-resistant illness is not characterized by elevated dopamine signaling. So this study suggests that there are potentially two types of schizophrenia, one high dopamine type, one normal dopamine type. We'll talk more about the possibility of biochemically distinct subtypes of schizophrenia in future lectures. So up to this point, we've seen that dopamine receptor blocking is highly relevant to the effectiveness of antipsychotic medications. Let's now talk about the second most relevant pharmacodynamic action of these drugs and its possible relevance to antipsychotic efficacy. And I'm speaking now about the ability of these drugs to interact with the serotonin receptor signaling system. So to what extent does serotonin antagonism affect or mediate the antipsychotic efficacy of these drugs? Well, the case, for, the case for relevance is made by the fact that serotonin receptor stimulation can, with fair frequency, produce hallucinations. Uh, drugs such as LSD, psilocybin, or DMT are well-known and very important uh, hallucinogenic agents, and they all share a common property of being able to stimulate um, a variety of serotonin receptors and have particularly, affin particularly high affinity for the type 2 subtypes of serotonin receptors. So therefore, um, serotonin blockade could indeed be relevant to relieving psychosis since it seems fairly obvious that serotonin stimulation, at least from the hallucinogenic drugs, um, can fairly reliably produce psychosis. So although there are some reasons to suspect that serotonin blocking is important and relevant to the psychosis relieving ability of antipsychotic drugs, this, these suppositions um, meet with some other observations which run counter to that hypothesis. Uh, for example, there is not a clear-cut relationship between the affinity of any antipsychotic drug for a serotonin receptor and the potency of that drug to alleviate psychosis. Recall in the case of the D2 receptor affinity, the graph showed a very linear relationship between affinity and oral potency of drugs, and we don't see such relationships if we plot serotonin receptor affinity on the y-axis. Um, also to my knowledge, there's never been a demonstration that pure serotonin receptor antagonists are able to alleviate psychosis. And on the contrary, we have this very interesting third bullet point. Uh, the opposite may be true. Uh, rather than looking for serotonin receptor blocking to alleviate psychosis, what was found in one study was that serotonin receptor stimulation uh, could alleviate psychosis. And not only that, but in the study by Rosenzweig, Rosenzweig Lipson, um, the serotonin agonist uh, not only alleviated psychosis, but it promoted weight loss. So these observations make it less obvious or certainly more difficult to say with any certainty that serotonin receptor blocking um, is relevant to the psychosis relieving properties of the antipsychotic medications.
But that's not to say that serotonin receptor blockade is irrelevant um, as a clinical feature of these medications. Uh, the serotonin receptor blocking property of the atypical antipsychotic drugs uh, seems to actually account for the property of atypicality. In other words, serotonin receptor antagonism probably does uh, account for the lower risk of extrapyramidal side effects as well as a lower, lower burden of cognitive impairment in people with schizophrenia. By blocking serotonin receptors, it appears that we're able to indirectly increase the level of dopamine in desirable brain regions, such as the frontal cortex, uh, where this action may mediate improvements of motivation or cognition, or in the nigro striatal pathway, where indirectly elevating dopamine levels uh, would obviously reduce the risk of extrapyramidal side effect. So serotonin receptor antagonism brings some good qualities to these medications, but comes at a notable cost, um, and that is when you block serotonin receptors, you can fairly reliably stimulate people's appetite, and that's one of the leading hypotheses as to why the second generation drugs are so prone to weight gain as a side effect. So what about the other neurotransmitters commonly targeted by antipsychotic drugs, things like acetylcholine, norepinephrine, or histamine? Well, most of their interactions with other neurotransmitter receptor types appear unrelated to psychosis relief. Um, on the other hand, they do seem to contribute to side effect burden. So blocking acetylcholine at the muscarinic receptor can lead to the anticholinergic syndrome, which includes memory impairment, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, and so forth. Uh, interestingly, anti-muscarinic drugs uh, may as well contribute to increasing the risk of tardive dyskinesia. Um, paradoxically, at least in the short term, uh, blocking the muscarinic receptor does provide good relief of extrapyramidal side effects acutely, such as dystonic reactions. The, the action of antipsychotic drugs at histamine receptors has no known relevance to antipsychotic relief, to antipsychotic efficacy. Uh, rather, they do reliably produce sedation as well as appetite stimulation, and that's another pathway whereby second generation drugs uh, may increase weight. And uh, finally, blocking the norepinephrine signal at alpha receptors theoretically could um, result in some anxiety relief mediated by um, tamping down the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, however, that's speculative, and what is known is that alpha receptor blockade um, can fairly reliably produce orthostatic hypotension and give um, fall risk as a side effect. So we've talked about all the downsides of blocking acetylcholine signaling at the muscarinic receptor. There is an interesting and curious um, possibility whereby acetylcholine actions can be beneficial. And that uh, exception pertains to the action of um, medicines like clozapine on the nicotinic branch of the acetylcholine receptor system. Uh, so Specifically, clozapine can function as an agonist or a stimulator at the alpha-7 configuration of the acetylcholine nicotinic receptor. And alpha-7 alpha nicotinic receptor stimulation is very interesting because stimulating that receptor can translate into improving cognition and reducing inflammation and the inflammation reduction property is um, in turn very interesting because we'll talk in future lectures about how inflammation is a uh, pathway of very significant etiological relevance to the expression of schizophrenia symptoms. So theoretically, um, drugs that stimulate the nicotinic receptor, particularly the alpha-7 configuration, may, um, may ultimately have benefits to schizophrenia. And so to conclude, we started the talk by asking the question, how do antipsychotic medications work? The clearest answer to this question is that they work by blocking dopamine signal at the D2 family of dopamine receptors. That seems very clear.
We also know that most of the antipsychotic drugs and essentially all of the second generation or atypical drugs are serotonin receptor blockers. And this serotonin antagonism seems to confer the property of atypicality, meaning that that's the mechanism whereby they have lower risks of EPS. But the extent to which serotonin receptor antagonism contributes to reduction of psychosis uh, is debatable. And finally, in the case of clozapine, we have an example of a drug which has a much higher effect size than any other antipsychotic drug and is reliably effective in the treatment of the type of schizophrenia that doesn't respond to, to other antipsychotic drugs. So clozapine may be categorically different and it may be a categorically different molecule and it may treat a fundamentally different form of illness that still nonetheless gets called schizophrenia. Understanding how clozapine exerts these preferentially higher effects is an important question that promises to unlock more of the mysteries of schizophrenia, and we'll talk more about the possible physiological explanation for schizophrenia, schizophrenia symptoms, as well as more about the um, actions of clozapine in subsequent talks within the series.